Well, good afternoon, everyone. I, too, am very delighted to be here to um, talk about Iraq. I was the first went to Iraq in uh, May and June of 1980 for a two-month visit. Uh, I was invited there by Saddam Hussein's regime to write a book that was pro-Bathist. And I used that opportunity to return on a number of occasions in the 1980s and really gain great respect for the Iraqi people and, of course, deep hatred for all the horrors that were being uh, imposed on that uh, populace by Saddam's regime. So I'd like to talk a little bit today about uh, Iraq. I'm very bullish on Iraq, and I think that many of the comments I make about Iraq are going to go really far beyond uh, that particular country to the Middle East uh, at large. Let me start by saying that I think there are a lot of stereotypes, and that's one reason we don't understand the region. I think some people believe that we actually live on two planets. There is one planet that all of us here live on, and then there is that planet of people in the Middle East. Uh, it's violence, it's irrationality, it's inability to understand democracy. Uh, nothing, as I'll try to point out today, uh, is further from the truth in Iraq, and much of what I'm going to say about Iraq could actually be said about much of the rest of the Middle East. So uh, let's move to the first, uh, uh, first slide here. And um, I want to point out that I'm going to be going over material. As I can see, the time is ticking away. I have a lot to try to pack in here in about 18 to 20 minutes. I have an uh, email here, obviously. You should feel free to email me. I might not be able to get back to you right away, but I guarantee if you write to me, I will get back. And for those of you who can't sleep well at night, I have a a blog and a website, and most people tell me that it leads to a quite restful sleep with no uh, chemical reaction. Uh, so let's move along to our first slide. Um, and uh, the first thing I want to point out is to deal quickly with stereotypes. Iraq is not uh, a group of ethnic groups. Uh, it's not a collection of ethnic and confessional groups. Uh, in terms of our second slide, we will see, uh, if we use our, our pointer here, that yes, um, Am I not uh, doing this right? This, these three provinces up here are Kurdish majority. Um, this so-called Sunni triangle here uh, from Baghdad out to the west and then up to Mosul uh, is primarily Sunni Arab. And in Baghdad in the south, we have about 60% uh, Shia, about 15 to 20% Sunni, and about uh, 15 to 20% Kurd. We have some other min minorities as well as you can see here. No part of Iraq uh, is ethnically homogeneous. And most people think that uh, Iraqis uh, hate each other uh, because of their, either their ethnicity, Arabs versus Kurds, or religion, Sunnis versus Shia. And uh, as I will argue in just a minute, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, if we look at the next slide here, we will see that many Iraqis uh, consider themselves still very much tied to tribes, even people who have PhDs. And tribal uh, identifications oftentimes cross-cut uh, religious identifications. So, for example, there is virtually no tribe, no Arab tribe in Iraq that does not have both Sunni and Shiite clans. And let me give you a quick example of the uh, Muntafek Confederation, which is 300 Shiite clans and has always, for hundreds of years, been ruled by a Sunni sheikh. Um, I want to now move on to Iraq's civiliz civilizational contributions. And uh, here point out that, um, we can go to the next slide, that Iraq is known, there's a great book which I have listed at the bibliography at the end of this presentation by Sidney Noah Kramer called History Begins at Sumer, uh, in which he points to 34 firsts that Iraq contributed to the world. For example, we know that the first language was developed in Iraq, cuneiform. Uh, the first legal code, Hammurabi's legal code, 1772 BCE, and that is still part of most of the legal codes of the world today. The first use of the term freedom, as we understand it in modern parlance, and the first parliament, where a king who was going to go to war had to go to the parliament, something we still have problems with in our own country today, and get permission from that parliament to engage in war. If you go to the next slide, please. And here you see how cuneiform developed, and here you see the stele of Hammurabi's uh, 282 laws, which are uh, on site. You can get them on the internet. And they were posted in front of every building. And what's very interesting about Hammurabi's code is the fact that he took uh, concern with the less fortunate. Now think about this uh, that, that many years ago. If we can go to our next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, how Iraq is critical to the US, 
we know that it's a very large uh, oil producer. Probably at the end of the day, it will be the second largest oil producer in the world. 70% of its oil and natural gas is still to be discovered. And you can see from the statistics here that there's a huge amount of hydrocarbon wealth in that country. Uh, Iraq's oil is extremely high quality, especially in the south. It's the cheapest to extract anywhere in the world. It's low sulfur content. I mean, it's good for commercial aircraft and fighter jets. Uh, Iraq, obviously, with what's going on in Iran with nuclear weapons, is very strategic. Um, it's the only country in the Middle East uh, that really has oil uh, and significant water resources, as well as human capital. There's a saying that anybody who knows the Middle East has heard that the Egyptians write, the Lebanese publish, and the Iraqis read. And it's true. Even when I was in Iraq, I brought in books that people were not supposed to be reading. Everybody's coming to my room at night, even though they're being photographed by the Secret Service agent who was standing outside the room. They're, they're a tough, tough bunch of people. Okay, let's talk about the United States. Now, this is not the time for me to really, uh, we can go to the next slide, please, uh, to talk really about all the dimensions of the U.S. occupation. But when people ask themselves, why is Iraq facing so many problems today? I'd say go home and look in the mirror uh, tonight in, in your bathroom. Because a lot of what the Bush administration did, it, it changed course in 2006 to give it credit. But initially, uh, for example, allowing a tremendous amount of looting, uh, dissolving Iraq's conscript army, not Saddam Hussein's special guards, Republican guards, or his Praetorian guard. Uh, they hated Saddam. They'd been left to be carpet bombed in 1991 uh, in uh, Kuwait. Uh, he fired uh, people who were a part of the Ba'ath Party only because they had to join. Uh, that was you know, something that was de rigueur, and all those people uh, eliminated a lot of technological innovations and, and expertise, and agricultural subsidies were done away with is if we don't subsidize agriculture here in our own country. And that led a lot of young farmers to go to cities where they joined militias and, and uh, insurgent groups fighting American troops. Uh, and here you see that the only two ministries that we really uh, secured were the Ministry of Oil, which you can see in the upper uh, left-hand quadrant, and the Republican Palace where the Ministry of Defense was. And you can see on the right, the Ministry of Culture, which was completely trashed to the point that the copper wiring was pulled out of the walls. And of course, no one had any opportunity to go back to work. Um, the Iraq Museum, which contains a lot of uh, the world's patrimony. If we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, you can see here that it took five days for an American captain with a satellite phone to get US Army troops to come and secure the Iraq Museum. A lot of its priceless artifacts were either stolen uh, or destroyed. And uh, this is a cartoon which shows the United States is kind of setting up sectarianism. Because we've, we formed the first government in the history of modern Iraq, of what, uh, what I call the kind of Chinese menu approach. One from column A, one from column B, one from column C, and so on and so forth. In other words, we, we set the whole government up according to Sunni, Shiites, and Kurds. And we sent a message to Iraqi politicians that that's the way the country should operate. We also set up a very poorly designed uh, constitution, which I think was intended to give uh, U.S. oil companies access to oil, especially in the South. And we worked with uh, expat groups like a group that uh, I don't think any of you here would want to join, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq. So again, uh, I would argue that many of the impediments that Iraqis faced with democratization come from our own problem. If we can move to the next slide, please. So we had elections in 2005, parliamentary elections for a transitional national assembly and then a full national assembly. Uh, you can see all the candidates that we had, 60% turnout. Uh, the last time I think we had 60% turnout in the presidential election was 68 with Humphrey Nixon. Uh, we had a constitution that was ratified. And to give the Americans credit, uh, they suggested to the Iraqis and they agreed that 25% of the Iraqi parliament be women. We can go to the next slide, please. And here you see how dangerous it was because Al-Qaeda said they were going to kill anybody who voted. And of course, uh, in my electoral district back in New Jersey, I also have to put my finger in a, in a bottle and, and have ink on it for a week. But in, this is very dangerous because unless you're going to hide your hand for a week, uh, you are obviously uh, a target. Um, we had provincial legislative elections in 2009. They were fair and free. They were like our own state elections here. Uh, the, by this time, the Iraqis had re-established the army and the police, so people dumped a lot of sectarian militias, 
who had given them protection like hotcakes. And we saw that parties emphasizing services rather than sectarianism were uh, brought to power. If we can move on, please. Uh, the Kurds, to keep them in the uh, Iraqi system, well, we don't have our map here, again, um, uh, in the three northeastern uh, provinces, they were allowed by the Constitution to set up their own autonomous region. And they have their own parliament. In their own uh, parliament in 19, uh, 2009, rather, uh, a group of young people uh, and middle class professionals got together and formed the Goran or Change Party, uh, which won 25% of the vote, even though it was threatened and they were beaten and uh, fired from jobs, along with the services and reform list. And within this parliament since that time, they've been able by constantly calling attention to government corruption to bring about a de decrease in that corruption. And here you see a Garan young gentleman uh, celebrating that night. And what's very significant, if you look at the logo here, you see that it's not only Garan in Kurdish, obviously in English, but also a Taghir, which in Arabic means change. So it's sending a message from the Kurds that they really want to work uh, with uh, uh, Arab Iraq. And I'm doing a five-nation study of youth in the Middle East. Uh, one of the main countries, of course, is Iraq. And one of the exciting developments I'm seeing is that young Kurds and young Arabs in their respective areas of the country are both very hostile to the authoritarianism of their respective regimes and are forming together to try to fight that. Next, parliamentary elections in 2010. Iraqis went back to their traditional form of voting uh, prior to Saddam. Uh, a secular list won 91 seats. Uh, religious clerics, the head of the Shiite community and the Sunni community, forced uh, Prime Minister Maliki to have an open list. He wanted People want parties want to have a closed list because remember, 25% of the seats have to be women, one out of every three seats. And by having a closed list where you didn't know who you were voting for, they could put in their mothers, sisters, daughters, you know, compliant. And by doing this, the religious clerics forced the Maliki not just to postpone the elections because his polls were bad, but to have an open list so that independent women could run and win seats. Um, so we had, again, uh, high turnouts, and everyone said that the elections was really fair. And here you see uh, that Nouriel Maliki in the upper, uh, this quadrant up here, uh, 337, and Ayad Alawi, uh, 332, and here are the two uh, Kurdish leaders. And I think it's very significant in Iraq that a major Arab country has occurred uh, as a president. If we could move to the next one, please. And here we see a lot of women uh, running. And I want to call your attention to this woman here, because this is the same woman. Uh, her name is Fairuz Hatem. And she is running for the most sectarian party that did very poorly in the 2010 elections. Now, this gives you an idea of what democratization is doing to political parties. Because in the quadrant here, here you see that uh, she is wearing makeup, jewelry, coiffured, looks very Western. In this poor neighborhood, which is called Sadr City in Baghdad, she's uh, covered with a, a, a hijab. She has no makeup, no jewelry. And the reason they did that is because they knew that people were not going to vote for parties simply on their religious sloganeering. Um, let's go to the public opinion uh, environment here quickly, since I'm running low on time. Anyway, this sign in Arabic emphatically says, uh, which means, please, please, don't talk about religion and politics in my shop. And I think that's very much the attitude of Iraqis that I've always been aware of. If we can move on, please. Um, that, they do, that they're not anti-religious. They don't want other people forcing the religion down their throats. Here we see, um, if we can look at uh, this thing that most people do not want religious leaders uh, influencing government. If we could move on, please. Uh, here you see that 63% of Iraqis, this is now at the height of the sectarian violence, want a mixed parliamentary presidential or parliamentary system. And here you see that, uh, and, and read this question very carefully at the top. Making Iraq more democratic will likely improve, improve services and our quality of life. What this tells you is that Iraqis don't want well, a democracy just for the, for the right to vote. They want a government that's going to provide services. And you can see when that's the case, there's very high support for democracy. This is a, a 2010 survey conducted by the International Republican Institute. And here, I think we have a James Carville moment. 
Uh, you can see that it's the economy, stupid. Iraqis are not worried about sectarianism, religious slogans, and symbolism. What they really are concerned with is jobs and unemployment and security. Um, now, I'm conducting focus groups uh, with uh, Iraqi youth throughout, and, and uh, about 600 Iraqi youth from the ages of 12 to uh, 30, and I'm going to go over those results very quickly. Uh, the research hypotheses basically say that uh, middle class youth, uh, youth that are highly educated and youth that are aware of Iraq's history before Saddam, which I'll talk about briefly in just a minute, are very hard and very, you know, very vigorously working to promote democratization in Iraq. Sectarian youth, oftentimes kids who come from the farm to urban areas, are uneducated, are fed a lot of nonsense. I you know, see an equivalence between them the militias that they join with the Ku Klux Klan, for example. Um, so we do have these two different types of, of groups. But let's move right to the um, uh, positive findings. Iraqi youth, in my survey research, do not subscribe to politicized religion. They reject sectarianism. They're very secular. They know about more about Western uh, hip hop and rap, which probably isn't saying very much than I do. Uh, and they desire the personal freedoms and economic freedoms that we, opportunity that, that we have here. Of course, they sometimes romanticize our own economic uh, opportunity, but nevertheless, they're highly respectful and interested in our culture. Uh, at the same time, they don't have uh, role models. Um, no one's expressed any admiration for any political leaders. They're visual learners, they don't read a lot, and they don't know much about their own history. But they are very active in developing civil society organizations, trying to help, for example, uh, women who don't have husbands who were killed in violence, uh, trying to help youth who've been traumatized by violence, so on and so forth. Okay, so here we see when we ask youth, how many times do you attend the Friday sermon, in other words, go to the mosque, 72% said never, only 8% 8, only 8 said, uh, you know, 9% uh, rather said four times. And we even asked those who went four times a month, most of them said because their parents made them do that. Um, Again, if we could move along. Here we see that 63% of, of youth uh, say that they're either moderate or liberal in terms of their uh, religious outlook. And um, none really want to belong to a political party. Uh, very few turn to Iran. So this whole idea that uh, Iraqis are enamored with neighboring Iran is certainly not true. From talking with Iraqis, I know very well that they see that the Iranian government, even though they like Iranians, the Iranian government has no uh, good ideas for uh, Iraq. Um, and again, we see here that if we look at this group of folks, uh, between the ones who have been socialized after 2003, they're much more positive about change that's taking place as opposed to these people who grew up during the horrible sanctions of the 1990s. Um, let's move on. And finally, uh, the last slide, uh, well, next to the last slide, most Iraqis do not uh, want to leave and go across, uh, leave the country. And that's true of the 60% of 60 Iraqi students that are in uh, at Rutgers. Uh, they're very, very homesick. They love the United States, very respectful, but they do not want to become citizens here. And finally, I think this points to something I'm going to end up with at the very end about um, uh, our uh, public diplomacy that we really need to because you can see here youth are still very uh, unsure about uh, what they want in terms of the relationship between Western and Middle Eastern culture. We could just move along very quickly here since I see I'm uh, run out of time. 70% of Iraqi youth, as I said, is under the age of um, 30. They're very active in demonstrations against the government every Friday. They want more democracy. They don't want to overthrow the democratic regime. Uh, unfortunately, many of them don't know much about their own history. That history, which uh, you can see uh, from a very interesting film that uh, I list in my bibliography called Forget Baghdad, was uh, uh, very important in the sense that it brought together all of Iraq's ethnic groups, Sunnis, Shiites, uh, Jews, and Christians. And by the way, the majority uh, ethnic group in Baghdad in 1920 was, uh, were the Jews, and Iraq's representative to the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 was Jewish. So the nationalist movement's history, I think, shows that Iraq's ethnic groups can work together. They understand democracy. Uh, they were very much involved in developing uh, professional movements. They're politically creative. And I also want to show the links between the past and, and the present. So on the left, we see a very famous uh, Iraqi architect and painter, Jawad Salim. 
And uh, you can see in his portrayal here of two women, uh, Iraqi women peasants, and you can see here the uh, emphasis on tradition, not only the peasant women, but the uh, crescent moon, uh, the symbol of Islam. But also, we, as anybody who looks at this knows that we uh, see here the impact of Picasso, Miro. So this is somebody who's trying to present, I think, a metaphor for modern society. We respect our past. We're going to deal with our past. We're going to valorize it. But we're not too afraid to borrow from other cultures. Um, here are some two. Uh, this is a soap opera that Iraqi youth developed called Love and War, which was, has been highly, highly popular because Iraqis don't like sectarianism. It's satirized sectarianism. Uh, here is you know, that show that's on TV where they go and build, rebuild people's houses who are very poor. Well, these were houses that were destroyed due to sectarian violence, and these young people went there and rebuilt them. They were oftentimes attacked, but they kept up, again, a wildly popular television program. Um, big blogosphere that's prevented uh, people from, or politicians from, rescinding one of the most progressive personal status law for women uh, in the Middle East. And here we have uh, Iraqis and all these signs saying Arabic, I'm from one ethnic group or another, and I'm against uh, sectarianism. Down here, we have Shiite youth in the south who literally sent their blood to Sunni new youth who were shot in uh, Baghdad by police for no reason. They were simply in a pool oil. Uh, so again, youth trying to uh, solve that problem. And finally, we have a, a book project. And I have actually some uh, literature on that, if you'd like to see me afterwards, where Iraqis have been putting uh, books all over uh, Baghdad and getting people to read and using it as an opportunity to come together and meet them. And now if I could just end with two final slides, uh, I'd like to say that Iraq is much too important to ignore. It's not just, that, as Bobby said, that so many Americans and Iraqis have died and so much blood and toil uh, has been expended. Uh, we need to organize forums. For example, in, in Princeton, and I lecture to this group from time to time, the Princeton Middle East Society uh, is a group of concerned citizens that bring in people from all over the country to speak about the Middle East. Uh, I just Skype with a social psychologist who's doing research with me in Iraqi youth. So we can Skype with people in Iraq and do video conferencing. And if we could just go to the final slide, uh, bring more Arab students or more Iraqi students uh, to, to the United States. Uh, that has a tremendous impact. When I was in Iraq during the 1980s, I met many Ba'athi officials who would rant and rave about American foreign policy, but then talk about their education in American universities, at which point they would have a huge smile on their face and say, that was the best years of my life. We can go to local mosques to find Iraqis to bring in. We can go to blogs. We can do what a lot of schools in this country have done, which is establish sister school programs. Go online and watch an exciting film that was done by four Iraqi youth that was then bought by HBO. You can see it right online called Baghdad High. It's about a Shiite, Kurd, Christian, and Sunni in a middle class neighborhood at the height of the violence in 2006, studying for their comprehensive exams, because unlike our kids, Iraqis take all their high school exams in one sitting at the end of their 12th year. And a very exciting film. And then the, the film Forget Baghdad, about four Iraqi Jews who left Iraq, forced to leave Iraq, didn't want to leave, went to Israel in the 1950s, and still consider themselves Iraqis today. The film has beautiful historical footage, and you can buy that on Amazon. And finally, there's the poet of Baghdad, a guy who wrote a 30-page poem against Saddam in 1978. Saddam spent huge amounts of money and all his secret services to catch this guy and all the photocopying places that were publishing this poem, which went viral. It shows the power of oral tradition of poetry. And this guy finally went to England in 2006, met up with a woman called Jo Tatchell. And she um, said, let's write a book not just about the poem you wrote, but about your family from 1945 to 19." Uh, I mean, 2006. And my students, when they read it at Rutgers, can't put it down. So finally, um, I'll just end with some um, bibliography here. And um, thanks again for your time. <laughs>